What exactly is involved in making a boat bigger? We all might want to add a couple feet here or there to the boat and then just transform it a little bit. But how will that affect the rest of the boat? And can the boat that you have support the boat that you want to make it into? In today's episode, we're going to be going over the math to figure out what exactly you need to have in order to make it structurally sound. Now this video is not going to make you a naval architect or give you a degree in mechanical engineering. That is not what this is about. It's very important that if you want to be doing this to your own boat, you don't just rely on YouTube videos. You have to do your reading and you have to learn. And then at the end of all that learning, you then have to talk to someone who knows what they're doing because you might be barking up the wrong tree. So you want to make sure that, that it's viable, what you're, what you're trying to do. So some books that I highly recommend reading because they will give you a very good understanding of what it is that you're trying to do here and how it will affect your boat are Skeen's Elements of Yacht Design because this book will give you an understanding of how the boat works. But it doesn't really go into the nitty gritty details of calculating how big or small something needs to be to accomplish the task at hand. And that is where Dave Gurr's Elements of Boat Strength comes in. This book will go into all of those details. It has all these formulas that I'm using. It's, it's incredibly detailed, but it does err on the more cautious side. So if you follow these numbers, you're going to end up with something that is overbuilt than it needed to be, which means that it's also going to be heavier than it had to be. Now, if you're okay with that, like I am, this is a great book for that. It's, it's very easy to follow, but it doesn't go into all the details about how does a boat work as a whole, which is where the other book from Skeen really does. Now, both of those books are a little on the older side, which is where this book comes into play. So this book is much more modern and the formulas in it are incredibly complicated and precise. You will definitely come up with a thinner number if you're using this book than if you're using the Elements of Boat Strength book, because this one it's more precise on exactly what you need to have and has less buffer, you could call it, but it's, it's really good. It's really complicated, but it's really good. So since I'm going for the easier and the thicker route, I'm going to be using Dave Gurr's book on the elements of boat strength because the formulas in it are just so much simpler compared to the ones in the principles of yacht design. The principles of yacht design is super good for calculating rig loads and just really, really calculating the forces that are gonna be on your boat. As I said, when you're done and you've done all your work, find a naval architect and run it by them because they can tell you at the end, whoa, 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 you, you missed this part because you do not have a degree in this. You do not know what it is that you're doing here. You're just trying something. So. There might be a glaring thing that you overlooked because you just didn't know it existed to look at. So it's really important. Be safe and talk it over with someone who does know. But this is all the legwork you can do ahead of time to see. Is it even a viable project to undertake and to even ask a naval architect about? First step in determining if the boat can even make this change is seeing how much are you going to be changing the scantling number of the boat. See, what happens is the boat is currently designed and all the parts in it to match the scantling number. If you have a boat that has a small scantling number, all the parts are thinner because they don't need to be that thick. If you then make a small boat bigger, guess what? The scantling number goes up, which means that all the members inside the boat also have to increase in size. What that means is if your boat is going to jump in size so greatly that the scantling number just balloons out of control, it's not really a feasible project. For example, if we're taking the Auberg 30 and turning it into a Morgan 45, like dimensions wise, the scantling number is going to jump from around 1.6 to about 3.5. That's, that's a huge difference, which means that the bulkheads are thicker, the tabbing is longer, everything is bigger. And then it's, it's a lot less practical. So it's important for the first thing that you do is calculate the scantling number of the boat that you have and the boat that you want it to be. Now, a little trick, if you have an iPhone, turn the calculator on its side and you get a scientific calculator and it makes all of this math a lot easier to do. It's very important to remember that by changing the boat, 
you're changing it from the design that a naval architect came up with and said, this is a good boat, and then produced it. And you're making it an experimental boat, a boat that there is only one of, and it's untested. So it's important to remember that while you're making these changes, you need to evaluate the entire boat as a whole, not only the piece that you're adding on. So Windpuff is starting off as an Auberg 30. Now, when we make this transom extension on the back, it's no longer going to be an Auberg 30. It's, it's not the boat that Carl Auberg designed. It's a completely different boat. So we need to make sure that the boat that we're going to end up with is going to be strong enough to support itself. So for the Auberg 30, we, to calculate the scantling number, we use 30 times 8.75 times 6 divided by 1,000. That gives us 1.575. For wind puff, it'll be 34 because we're making it four feet longer, times 8.75 times 6 divided by 1,000, and that comes out to be 1.785. So as you can see, there's not a huge jump in scantling number, which means that we're pretty safe at this point. Now from the scantling number, we can then calculate what is the basic shell thickness. Now, now this isn't the thickness that your hull is, this is... Uh, kind of the, the basic point where you then calculate what the thickness of the hull is at each individual area of the boat. So to calculate the basic shell thickness, you simply take the scantling number, you cube root it, and then you multiply that by 0.25. For the Auberg 30, we get the basic shell thickness is 0.29 inches thick. And for, the, and for wind puff, we get that the basic shell thickness is 0.3 inches thick. So, like I said, not much of a difference. Now. An Auberg 30 is a heavy displacement boat, so we have to add the heavy displacement increase to that shell thickness. So for that, the equation is 0.89 plus the displacement to length ratio divided by 2500. So we put in the math, it's you know 394.84, which is the displacement to length ratio for an Auberg 30, divided by 2500 plus 0.89. And that gives us 1.0479, which is about 1.05. So that means that it's a 5% increase to the shell thickness. We add the 5% to the basic shell thickness, and we see that the Auberg 30 goes from being 0.29 to 0.3. And that wind puff would go from 0.3 to 0.31. Now that's not all. We then need to look at the high stress areas of the boat, because those need to be up to snuff. So for that, you want to add another 25% of thickness. So doing that, we come that the Auberg 30 needs to be 0.38 inches thick, and Windpuff needs to be 0.39 inches thick. In other words, an Auberg 30 needs to be about 3 eighths of an inch thick, and a Windpuff needs to be 3.1 eighths of an inch thick. So really no difference there. So we're, we're good. And then you look at the actual thickness of an Auberg 30's hull which ranges from a half inch thick on the thin spots to uh, one inch and three sixteenths of an inch thick on the thicker spots. So it's a very thick boat. Being how it needs to be a smidge over three eighths of an inch and it is already a half inch thick, we're good. We don't actually need to add anything to the boat to make it strong enough for this addition. So that's the first part. Moving on to the next thing, stringers. Now, stringers run longitudinally. They go from bow to stern, and a boat is supposed to have 10 of them, so five on each side. You have one up near the shear, one at the turn of the bilge, one down near the keel, and then the other two between those three. Now, the Auberg 30 has a much thicker hull than it needs to have, and as a result, they didn't use stringers because it didn't need it. Now, being how I'm making this boat bigger, I'm putting stringers in because I don't know. I'm not a naval architect, so I'm going to play it safe and do the easy thing and just add stringers. Since it doesn't have them, putting stringers in automatically makes the whole thing stronger. So, why not do it? Now, to calculate the core size for the stringer, you take 3.12 times the scantling number to the power of 0.28. So, that's a fun one. So, we punch it in. You got 3.12 times... 1.785 to the power of 0.28. Punch that into the calculator, and we get 
a really long decimal, which is about 3.67 inches for the, for the width. For the height, it's half the width. So that means that the stringer needs to be 3.67 inches wide and 1.835 inches tall. So now you know the size and thickness of the stringer's core, but how much fiberglass do you put over the stringer to, to properly support it? That way the fiberglass is taking the right amount of load. Well, there's an equation for that, and it is 0.17 times the scantling number to the power of 0.38. So when you punch in all those numbers, you get that it's 0.21187 inches thick. That's a useful number. Now, if you're using 1708 from Total Boat, like I am, in the last video, we did a test where we calculated and tested exactly how many layers gives you how much thickness. And we found that every layer of fiberglass comes out to be 3 64ths of an inch thick. So using that, we can then calculate that we need about 4.52 layers of glass or five layers of glass. So what that means is we're going to lay down a stringer that's about 3.7 inches wide and 1.9 inches tall, and then we're gonna cover it in five layers of 1708. That's pretty much what we learned there. Now the stringer tabbing, we need to figure out how long that needs to be, and there's an equation for that. And it is 10 times your laminate thickness. So 10 times the 0.211 comes out to be 2.11 inches. So pretty much a smidge, over, like two and a quarter inches running out, you're good. All right, the next thing to calculate is how many bulkheads do we need to have in the boat? Now it's bulkheads or ring frames, either of them will do. How many do we need in a boat that is, you know, of this size, so 34 feet on deck? And from a graph that's on page 46 of this book, six. So we need six bulkheads or ring frames. Okay, so how thick do those bulkheads need to be? As you guessed it, there's an equation for that. So the thickness of the bulkhead is 0.45 times the scantling number to the power of 0.3. When you punch in those numbers, you get that it needs to be about 9 sixteenths of an inch thick. Now that's the thickness of the plywood for the bulkhead. Next, we need to calculate how wide the tabbing needs to be for the bulkheads. Now the equation for that is really complicated, so it's written down here for you. And it comes out to be that we need to do about 3.75, so three and three quarters of an inch tabbing run out off on, from the bulkhead onto the hull. That's, that's what we need to have there. Now the bulkhead backing is really important. A lot of boats don't have this and they should. So the bulkhead shouldn't actually just jam into the side of the hull because what happens is it creates a pressure point and that can lead to cracking. It, it's, it's a stress point on the boat that you just induced. So it's best not to have that. If your boat already has it, it's really hard to change it. So, you know, there it is. But if you're building the bulkheads, like we're going to be doing, you might as well do them right. So you want to have a backing plate that sits between the bulkhead and the hull to spread out the force. And that backing needs to be eight times the thickness of the bulkhead. So in our case, that means that the backing needs to be about 4.28 inches wide. So that's going to run all the way around behind where the bulkhead meets the hull. So that's a thing that we need to know because when we're making this, we need to put it there. <laughs> so to sum up the bulkheads, we're gonna need six of them. They need to be 9 16th of an inch thick at a minimum. The backing rings need to be 4.28 inches thick or wide. And the tabbing needs to be three and three quarters of an inch. Now, earlier I said we need six bulkheads or ring frames. Now a ring frame, is just that, it's a ring through the whole boat and it you can have it in lieu of a bulkhead. So it gives you the ability to have an open boat but still have the strength of the bulkheads. Now, in order to get that strength, you need to build a really big ring. <laughs> so the equation for the ring frame is 3.1 times the scantling number to the power of 0.3. In our case for wind puff, that means that the ring frame needs to be 3.7 inches wide and high. So that's a, almost a four inch block that's gonna be running the whole ring of the boat. So we're gonna need uh, a lot of those because there's some areas where we can't really put a bulkhead, but we need a bulkhead. So therefore we're gonna have a ring frame. So moving on to another part that the Auberg 30 does not have. And by adding it, we are then automatically making it stronger than it already was, which means it'll then be strong enough to support the addition we're adding, our floors. Now floors, aren't the cabin sole. It's not the part you walk on. You don't walk on the floor. 
you walk on the sole. The floor is beneath the sole, the same way that ceilings are actually the sides of a boat, not the roof. So the calculation for the floors for wind puff come out to be 3.7 inches thick and 11 inches high. So they're gonna be good sized floors. And then the fiberglass that goes over them needs to be five layers thick. Now the tabbing to attach the floor to the boat needs to run out 2.86 inches. Now for the important part, how many floors do we need to have? Well, under the mast step, it comes out that we need to have four floors. And then over the keel area, we need to have a floor every 18 inches on center. Now that's not 18 inches between each floor, that's 18 inches between the centers of each floor. So to sum up the floors for wind puff, they need to be 3.7 inches thick, 11 inches high, five layers of 1708 from total boat. The runout for the tabbing needs to be three inches. We need four floors under the mast, and then the keel area gets a floor every 18 inches. On to the next part chain plates. So we want to have external chain plates on wind pump. That means that the chain plate is not going to be bolted to the bulkhead, but instead is going to be bolted to the shell of the hull. Is that fiberglass strong enough to take the load? That's a really important question because if it isn't strong enough, you're going to rip your boat, your chain plates, the top side, like it's just going to tear everything apart. It's going to go horribly wrong. So you want to make sure this is okay to do. The equation to figure out how thick the fiberglass needs to be at the chain plate area is 1.3 times the top side laminate thickness. Now that's not your basic shell thickness, that's actually a little thinner than your basic shell thickness. In the sense of overbuilding things on this boat, I'm using the basic shell thickness for this equation. So it's 1.3 times the basic shell thickness, which comes out to be 0.39 inches thick. That's what we need to have for wind puff. As we already know, the top sides are currently a half inch thick at the thin points, which means that we are good. We don't actually need to add any fiberglass to this area to make it thicker, but we can if we want to. Now, how far, like how far fore and aft does the, does this extra fiberglass need to go? Well, the answer is pretty, pretty breathtaking. It needs to be equivalent to the beam of the boat at that spot. So the beam of the Alberg in that area is about eight feet, which means that the fiberglass needs to go four feet forward and four feet aft of each chain plate. So it's a good thing that it's already thick enough so we don't have to worry about this too much, but if you wanna make your own boat have external chain plates, this is a very important thing to calculate before you go drilling holes in your top sides. Now the height of this fiberglass is naturally from the shear all the way down the deck to the bottom of the chain plate. And then it has to continue 20 times the size of the lowest bolt. So if you have a half inch bolt, you're going 20 times a half, which means you have to go 10 inches south of the chain plate with this extra fiberglass. So these are all things you have to consider. And if your boat isn't thick enough in these areas, you now have to start taking apart the interior of your boat to get to the hull to go laying on this extra glass. This is why it's really nice to just do the math ahead of time and see, can this boat support these changes before I go diving into making these changes? So with that, we can easily calculate what the boat needs to be in order to support the new size that we want it to be. Now, if you're adding a foot to the back of your boat, naturally it's not gonna be that huge of a change in the scantling number. So if your boat's kind of overbuilt to begin with, you're good. If your boat is, you know, engineered to absolute perfection, and then you add on a little bit to it, you just changed everything. So that's that's a really, really important thing to keep in mind on, on which boat are you making these changes to. Now, some other things that get affected by changing the length of a boat. The center of buoyancy changes, the balance point changes, your center of gravity changes, all of these points are gonna move. And where they move depends on how you build this thing. If you build it in the water, it's going to move the center of buoyancy at all times. In our case, we're building it so it's above the water line, but when we heal, it goes into the water, which means that it's going to have an effect at some points in time, but not at all points in time. So this is where stuff starts to get really complicated and dicey, which is why it's really, really important to talk it over with a naval architect. And some advice that I, I really 
really actually enjoyed the advice was build it and test it. And I was thinking, how am I going to test this thing before before it's done? Like we attach this to the boat and it's built on. How am I going to test it on the hard? And the answer was so simple that I kind of feel dumb for not thinking of it. Have some large buddies hang themselves from the thing. Just hold on and pull down and see if it flexes. If it flexes a lot from just the weight of a human body hanging from it, it's not strong enough. You got to add some more parts to it. The opposite is true. Poke a halyard to the thing and start cranking and lifting the part up. If it starts flexing coming up, it's not strong enough. Add more to it. So the, that like build it and then also test it approach. I really, really appreciate it because I was, I wasn't really sure how we could test it other than, you know, build it to completion and then go sail with it and see how it works after years and years of work leading to that point. And that, I was really worried about that. But thankfully, the, their idea of test it on the hard like that, it it's so, it's intuitive. It, it just, it makes so much sense. And I kind of feel dumb for not thinking of it myself. But that's why you want to talk to people who know what they're doing, because they can give you like the smallest bit of advice to them. And it, it makes a huge difference to you. So with WinPuff, that is all the math that we're going to be doing to calculate all of these changes that we're making to the boat. It's There's a lot to be done there. There's a lot going on in it. And, well, there it is. It's not just a willy-nilly, let's just slap on uh, a butt extension on the boat and then go sailing and be happy with it. It's There's a lot of calculations that go into deciding how will we do this and how will we do this correctly? So that is the math that I'm using. And if you want to do any of these kind of changes to your boat, I highly suggest doing this math at the very beginning, just to make sure that it, the project can actually be done to completion. Because think about it, if you do all this math later in the project, you've put so much time, effort, and resources into all the materials and, and everything to make this come to be, to then find out that it's just mechanically not sound. So it's that's why it's so important to always do the math beforehand while you're still in the planning phase, just to see, is this even viable to, to pursue? So let me know down in the comments what the scantling number is for your boat as it currently sits, and what the scantling number would be for the changes you want to make to your own boat. I, I'd love to see, like, the, the differences that are going to come up from these different modifications that we all want to do to our own boats. So let me know down in the comments, and I look forward to seeing you at the next episode. We've got big plans for the small boat.